Just look at these white hairs down here, huh? Jeez. Okay, here we go. Is this working okay? Looks a little wobbly. Don't want to do this for nothing. But suppose it's like me when it's born. Sam had scrupled not to interject with an almost comic solemnity. Oh, it's not born yet, you wretch, she had replied in quite a flighty tone. And there had been an interchange of tender, half-humorous speculation between them after that as to whether this unknown offspring of theirs would be a boy or a girl. And Sam had said he hoped it would be a girl, and she had said, her mind all the time thinking, how different this is from what I thought it would be, that if he really wanted it to be a girl, she would make it a girl by thinking of nothing else all this time. And then the trouble between them began. Sam started it by talking on and on to her about some startling experience he had recently had. Something to do with a mad woman and the old curiosity shop man on Maudy Thursday when he was climbing World Hill with John Crow and Tom Barter. But he was so clumsy at expressing himself and she was so slow in catching the drift of his thought that they irritated each other in the way simple-minded people so easily do by their mutual misunderstanding long before he even reached the real danger point of what he was trying to tell her. Something that's been coming over me for some time now, he said, with his hand tightening so fast upon hers and his anxiety to make herself clear that he hurt her fingers. It's not religion in my father's sense, for I don't believe in anything at all. I like your father very, very much, Nell threw in. No, no, he went on. It's not religion in his sense, because I don't believe in one single of one of all those things. He knew he was expressing himself lamely and badly, in fact childishly, but all he could do was to go on hurting her soft, formless schoolgirl fingers in his muscular grip. Her own mind was so benumbed that the discourse between them at the dark, brushed afternoon on Easter Monday went on, would have seemed to any eavesdropper and incoherent as the talk of a couple of inmates in the state asylum so much dreaded by Mad Bet. It's not that I am considering Christ simply as an ordinary man, affirmed Sam in a high-pitched dialectical tone. I am considering him as a god. But I'm considering him as a god among other gods. I'm considering him, him as a god who is against the cruelty of the great creator god. What has given so much an extraordinary feeling of happiness these last days is the idea that ever since Christ was tortured to death by the Romans to please the Jews, there's been a secret company of disciples who have believed in his method of fighting the cruel creator god, these methods of his, simple and yet very hard to catch the drift of, till they get... A sudden illumination, like St. Paul, only mine came to me on Silver Street at the bottom of the drive where you can see the elms over the wall. Let's go by hand, you're hurting me. Up went her fingers to her sulky red mouth when he released her. He had certainly left them bloodless. She began to feel hungry. I wish, he thought, I could just run into the kitchen and put the kettle on without hurting his feelings. How queer men are. He has already completely forgotten that I've made him a father. I don't believe in the church now, Sam went on, like father does. I don't believe in the creed at all. But I believe in the mass, what is our church we call the sacrament. I believe, as it says in Latin, venum caro factum est. The word was made flesh. Verbum caro factum est. I think I'll put the kettle on, she murmured, without realizing the irony of these last words, so apparently unrelated in his mind to the word made flesh in herself. He, she had grown so hungry and had come so long so desperately for a cup of tea that when he came to utter the word creed, he was on the tip of her tongue to give vent to a quivering, long drawn out scream so that the great Latin syllables fell on deaf ears. Sam the Naturalist had certainly been overlaid by Sam the Theologian, but there was a sturdy animal instinct in him that now broke through the spiritual chain armor that he was wearing like a tight-fitting aura or like an electric body. 
He broke through this aura with such a leap that the girl was frightened. I'll put it out for you, he cried suddenly, getting up with a bound for his side. He rushed into the kitchen, and she heard him empty the fill the kettle. And then she heard him clattering with iron cover of the stove as he pushed it aside with a short poker she kept for that purpose and settled the kettle in its place. He hasn't even looked to see how the fire is, she thought. With a weary sigh, she got up and followed him. She caught him staring out at the kitchen window as she entered in an ecstatical stare, like the stare of a village boy watching the circus clown. What is it? she asked, putting her arm on his shoulder. She wanted him to fondle her and tell her how wonderful she'd been to make him a father. Instead of this, he drew away from her touch. Oh, you will understand, Nell, darling, he said. When I have told you everything, why it can't be like I was before. He turned his broad back upon her and walked out of the kitchen. He made blindly for the couch where they had been sitting where she murmured about the kettle. And she followed him submissively to that familiar couch. She made a motion of slow to sit on his knee, but he warded her off, clutching her wrist with a rough violence and pulling her down by his side. That's what I really came to see you about, Nell, to be absolutely frank with you, as we always are with each other, aren't we? She thought bitterly to herself that if she had been less frank with him this afternoon, never said a single syllable about her condition, he would not have acted the least differently from the way he was acting now. A faint shivering, like the shivering that had seized her when she read her brother's pamphlet, came upon her now. Was Sam, her dear Sam, going to join that great staring army of men, 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 with hairy wrists and hairy chests, men with hard sharp knees, men with brains like printing presses, between whom she had to run the gauntlet, and to take her place, and her child had to take its place, in a regimented state, ordered not by nature, but by tyrannical science? What was it that Sam was saying now? And so, though of course I shall always love you, and you will always be my true love, and we'll be seeing each other just as much as we do now, I've come to the conclusion that it's wrong for me to make love to you any more. The pleasure I get from that kind of thing is so intense for me, it may, may, may not be so with other people, but it is for me, that it kills this new feeling. Not a tear came to her eyes. They did not open, or shut, or twitch, or blink, or quiver. Her hands remained lying quietly on her lap, just as they had been when he first let them go. She did not clasp them now, nor did she fumble with the loose folds of the green apron which covered her crocus yellow gown. She forced herself to look into the eye of this speaking man, into the eyes of this man-mask, whose chin, as he uttered his unkind words, imitated the familiar contra contractions of her dear Sam's chin. Her simplicity of nature was such that the blow itself brought her own recompense. She was not tormented by doubts. Her Sam had changed into someone else. Her Sam had changed into a being who called himself the lover of a god called Christ and who henceforth would think it wrong to love Nell Zoyland. Nell made absolutely nothing of what he said about loving her still, though it would be wrong to make love to her. Such was her character that, such was her competition conception of love, that to make love meant simply to love, and not to make love meant simply not to love. I don't quite understand, Sam dear. He put her arm around her and pressed her to him, and they stayed like that for a while in sorrowful silence, while outside their walls nothing stirred except the flowing of the river that was like a channel without a bottom, so darkly it poured its flood, as if the somberness of the low gray skies and the forlorn depths had been transferred to its augment, had transferred it to it to augment its desolation. Sam, dearest, did you like me the first time you saw me? This innocent question which had passed between them, a question and answer so often al already, had become like a familiar noise gay, nosegay by that time, which was handed from one to another, to smell it and pass back again. 
but it was not the moment for more ardent caresses. Now, when caresses were to be altogether renounced, this invisible nosegay gathered to itself a poignant significance. There were actually tears in Sam's eyes as he lifted her hand and his lips and swore that he had liked her before he saw her, that he had dreamed of her from Plenty Pitch's description when he had first heard her name. She made a little movement at this, cuddling up yet closer to him, so that the warmth of their body flowed into his. Her green pinafore was open at the sides, and she leant against him, he could see, oh, and feel too, the rounded tightness of her yellow bodice as a deep drawn sigh expanded her lovely breasts. It was only by forcing himself to think of that tortured shadow hovering above his father's roof. It was only by forcing himself to visualize the actual prints of the nails in that shadow's hands. That he had the strength to stiffen himself and not to yield. That he had the strength to hold that clinging sweetness away from him. But so piteously was his whole nature stirred that big tears now rolled slowly down his cheeks several of them actually reaching his twitching chin. They were tears of miserably pity for himself and for her, and for more than themselves. In the pressure of that dark hour, there weighed upon him the whole burden of the round world's tragic grief as it swung at its axis. The loneliness of the cold, gurgling stream outside, with that sorrowful sky reflected in it, the silence of that little house enclosing them amid the larger silence of the wide moors. All these things flowed into Sam's heart till it felt as if it must break. To have been given such quivering sweetness and to have to push it away with his own hand. He had known that it would be hard, but this was worse than he had imagined. The feeling that their passionate mixing together had created a new life, a life that was the knot of their intertwining made it seem as if an outrage was being done to them both, a rending, tearing, remorseless outrage that must make a red wound in time itself, that slippery smooth time, the long black snake that was gliding away under their feet. She kept making little heartbreaking movements to cling closer to him, and he had to put all his will into the arm that held her back to keep it stiff, to make it like a sword between them. I thought you'd be pleased when you knew I was going to have a child. I am pleased, Nell. Your child will be the only child I shall ever have now. And I'm glad it's yours. Zoyland may be generous. I mean, later on, when things are different. I can't believe it, Sam. When I look at you sitting so close to me, you have stopped loving me, just when I'm sure about our child. Sam was the extreme opposite of a moral catsuist. It would have been better for Nell if his conscience had been more sensitive and his passion less strong. It was the strength of his passion for her that made the issue between her and Christ so deadly clear to him. In those subtle human relations, Sam had the blunt obstuteness of a beast, a beast with far less conscience than a faithful dog. He was indeed a forest beast, bear at that moment, a bear that was rejecting a treasure trove of wild honey for the sake of a garden hive that he had found. Nell was just then too stunned to feel anything but their fatal change in him, but later, when she had time to think, she found herself amazed at the unscrupulousness with which he was prepared to allow her to deceive Zoylan about the child. Whatever it was that he had touched him, with its terrible spell, it had left him as non-moral as a savage. There was nothing human left in him to which a girl could appeal. In his mind at that moment, there seemed to be only two alternatives, possessing Nell or being possessed by Christ. A month-old conception, a year-old love, what were these besides the ecstasy, the blind exultation of sharing the sufferings of a god? Sam, Sam, love me again, love me again. He made a funny little gurgling sound in his throat and looked away from her, looked towards the window. At that moment there was steps on the brick path outside and a sharp knock at the door. They both leapt to their feet and Nell, after a moment's hesitation and quick glance around the room, 
went to the door and opened it. There stood Persephone Spear. A tall, equivocal girl entered furtively and quietly, closing the door behind her. Her appearance altered everything in a moment. It caused the surge in both Nell and Sam that curious, blind irritation, unique in life, that the invasion of an outsider evokes and that sounds souls of two people who are in the throes of some nervous dispute. Persephone wore her usual rough ultra cape and below this a gray jersey and black shirt. On her head was a tight-fitting dark woolen cap. She was certainly in an agitated mood and in a dogmatic tyrannical one. She moved uneasily about the little room, disengaged, disregarding Nell's entreaties to sit down. She went up to the tiny cottage piano with the Marquis of P had given the Zoilands on their marriage and ran her fingers over its wistful, untuned keys. What's this, she said, picking up the loose cover of the pamphlet that Nell had burned. Did Dave leave it? Then she came and stood in front of them, staring out the window. What's it going to do, she asked, frowning. It's the worst day we've ever had since I've been down here. It's a terrible day. There was a tone in her voice that reduced the weather to a troublesome appendage to human life, to a tiresome dog that was behaving badly. Then she left the window and crossed over to the fire. Why don't you burn more wood, Nell, she said. It gives out much more heat than this wretched coal. Then again, before Nell had time to reply, she was pulling out a book from Nell Wills Island's bookshelf. Does your William read Arabia Deserta? No, I can't see he doesn't. It's not cut. She turned the pages irritably. You know what Doey would call a little creature like you, Nell, in this Bedouin tent? He'd call you a bint. That's a good, good word, isn't it? To describe a sweet little girl like you. She returned Doey to the shelf with a violent shove and hurried again to the window. It looks as if it wants to rain black rain today. I've never seen anything so miserable, except my life. I'll leave it at that. It's a good way to end for today. Till next time, I'll see you in Glastonbury.